Chapter Three of The Man in the Iron Mask. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Man in the Iron Mask by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Three Who Messire Jean Percerin Was. The King's Tailor, Messire Jean Percerin, occupied a rather large house in the Rue Saint Honore, near the Rue de l'Arbre Sec. He was a man of great taste in elegant stuffs, embroideries, and velvets, being hereditary tailor to the king. The preferment of his house reached as far back as the time of Charles the Ninth, from whose reign dated, as we know, fancy and bravery difficult enough to gratify. The Percerin of that period was a Huguenot, like Ambrose Paré, and had been spared by the Queen of Navarre, the beautiful Margot, as they used to write and say, too, in those days, because, in sooth, he was the only one who could make for her those wonderful riding habits which she so loved to wear, seeing that they were marvellously well suited to hide certain anatomical defects, which the Queen of Navarre used very studiously to conceal. Percerin, being saved, made, out of gratitude, some beautiful black bodices, very inexpensively indeed, for Queen Catherine, who ended by being pleased at the preservation of a Huguenot people, on whom she had long looked with detestation. But Percerin was a very prudent man, and having heard it said that there were no more dangerous sign for a Protestant than to be smiled upon by Catherine, and having observed that her smiles were more frequent than usual, he speedily turned Catholic with all his family, and having thus become irreproachable, attained the lofty position of Master Taylor to the crown of France. Under Henry the Third, gay king as he was, this position was as grand as the height of one of the loftiest peaks of the Cordilleras. Now Percerin had been a clever man all his life, and by way of keeping up his reputation beyond the grave, took very good care not to make a bad death of it, and so contrived to die very skilfully, and that at the very moment he felt his powers of invention declining. He left a son and a daughter, both worthy of the name they were called upon to bear, the son a cutter, as unerring and exact as the square rule, the daughter apt at embroidery and at designing ornaments. The marriage of Henry the Fourth and Maria de Medici and the exquisite court mourning for the aforementioned queen, together with a few words let fall by Monsieur de Bassompierre, king of the beau of the period, made the fortune of the second generation of Percerins. Monsieur Concino Concini and his wife Galigui, who subsequently shone at the French court, sought to Italianize the fashion and introduce some Florentine tailors, but Percerin, touched to the quick in his patriotism and his self-esteem, entirely defeated these foreigners, and that so well that Concino was the first to give up his compatriots, and held the French tailor in such esteem that he would never employ any other, and thus wore a doublet of his on the very day that Vitry blew out his brains with a pistol at the Pont de Louvre. And so it was a doublet issuing from Monsieur Pesserin's workshop, which the Parisians rejoiced in hacking into so many pieces with the living human body it contained. Notwithstanding the favour Concino Concini had shown Percerin, the king, Louis the Thirteenth had the generosity to bear no malice to his tailor, and to retain him in his service. At the time that Louis the Just afforded this great example of equity, Percerin had brought up two sons, one of whom made his debut at the marriage of Anne of Austria, invented that admirable Spanish costume, in which Richelieu danced a saraband, made the costumes for the tragedy of Mirame, and stitched on to Buckingham's mantle those famous pearls which were destined to be scattered about the pavements of the Louvre. A man becomes equally notable who has made the dresses of a Duke of Buckingham, a Monsieur de saint mar a Mademoiselle Ninon, a Monsieur de Beaufort, and a Marianne de Lorme. And thus Percerin the Third had attained the summit of his glory when his father died. This same Percerin the Third, old, famous, and wealthy, yet further dressed Louis the Fourteenth, 
and having no son, which was a great cause of sorrow to him, seeing that with himself his dynasty should end, he had brought up several hopeful pupils. He possessed a carriage, a country house, men's servants the tallest in Paris, and by special authority from Louis the Fourteenth, a pack of hounds. He worked for Messieurs de Lyon and Le Tellier, under a sort of patronage, but politic man as he was, and versed in state secrets, he never succeeded in fitting Monsieur Colbert. This is beyond explanation. It is a matter for guessing, or for intuition. Great geniuses of every kind live on unseen, intangible ideas. They act without themselves knowing why. The great Percerin, for, contrary to the rule of dynasties, it was, above all, the last of the Percerins, who deserved the name of Great. The great Percerin was inspired when he cut a robe for the queen, or a coat for the king. He could mount a mantle for monsieur, the clock of a stocking for madame, but in spite of his supreme talent, he could never hit off anything approaching a creditable fit for monsieur Colbert. That man, he used often to say, is beyond my art. My needle can never dot him down. We need scarcely say that Percerin's was Monsieur Fouquet's tailor, and that the superintendent highly esteemed him. Monsieur Percerin was nearly eighty years old, nevertheless still fresh, and at the same time so dry, the courtiers used to say, that he was positively brittle. His renown and his fortune were great enough for Monsieur le Prince, that king of fops, to take his arm when talking over the fashions and for those least eager to pay, never to dare to leave their accounts in arrear with him, for Master Pesserin would for the first time make clothes upon credit, but the second never, unless paid for the former order. It is easy to see at once that a tailor of such renown, instead of running after customers, made difficulties about obliging any fresh ones, and so Pesserin declined to fit bourgeois, or those who had but recently obtained patents of nobility. A story used to circulate that even Monsieur de Mazarin, in exchange for Percerin supplying him with a full suit of ceremonial vestments as cardinal, one fine day slipped letters of nobility into his pocket. It was to the house of this great Lama of Tailors that D'Artagnan took the despairing Porthos, who, as they were going along, said to his friend, Take care, my good D'Artagnan, not to compromise the dignity of a man such as I am, with the arrogance of this Percerin, who will, I expect, be very impertinent. For I give you notice, my friend, that if he is wanting in respect, I will infallibly chastise him. Presented by me, replied D'Artagnan, you have nothing to fear, even though you were what you are not. Ah! Tis because— what? Have you anything against Percerin, Porthos? I think that I once sent Mouston to a fellow of that name. And then? The fellow refused to supply me. Oh, a misunderstanding, no doubt, which it will be now exceedingly easy to set right. Mouston must have made a mistake. Perhaps. He has confused the names. Possibly. That rascal Mouston never can remember names. I will take it all upon myself. Very good. Stop the carriage, Porthos. Here we are. Here? How here? We're at the hall, and you told me the house was at the corner of the Rue de l'Arbre Sec. Tis true, but look. Well, I do look, and I see. What? Pardieu! that we are at the house. You do not, I suppose, want our horses to clamber up on the roof of the carriage in front of us? No. Nor the carriage in front of us to mount on top of the one in front of it. Nor that the second should be driven over the roofs of the thirty or forty others which have arrived before us. No, you are right indeed. What a number of people! And what are they all about? Tis very simple. They are waiting their turn. Bah! Had the comedians of the Hotel de Bourgogne shifted their quarters? No, their turn to obtain an entrance to Monsieur Percerin's house. 
and we are going to wait too oh we shall show ourselves prompter and not so proud what are we to do then get down pass through the footmen and lackeys and enter the tailor's house which i will answer for our doing if you go first come along then said porthos they accordingly alighted and made their way on foot towards the establishment the cause of the confusion was that monsieur passerin's doors were closed while a servant standing before them was explaining to the illustrious customers of the illustrious tailor that just then Monsieur Passerin could not receive anybody. It was bereaded about outside still, on the authority of what the great lackey had told some great noble whom he favoured, in confidence, that Monsieur Passerin was engaged on five costumes for the king, and that, owing to the urgency of the case, he was meditating in his office on the ornaments, colours, and cut of these five suits. Some, contented with this reason, went away again, contented to repeat the tale to others. But others, more tenacious, insisted on having the doors opened, and among these last three blue ribbons, intended to take parts in a ballet, which would inevitably fail unless the said three had their costumes shaped by the very hand of the great Perserin himself. D'Artagnan, pushing on Porthos, who scattered the groups of people right and left, succeeded in gaining the counter, behind which the journeyman tailors were doing their best to answer queries. We forgot to mention that at the door they wanted to put off Porthos like the rest, but D'Artagnan, showing himself, pronounced merely these words, The King's Order, and was let in with his friend. The poor fellows had enough to do, and did their best, to reply to the demands of the customers in the absence of their master, leaving off drawing a stitch to knit a sentence, and when wounded pride, or disappointed expectation, brought down upon them too cutting a rebuke, he who was attacked made a dive and disappeared under the counter. The line of discontented lords formed a truly remarkable picture. Our captain of musketeers, a man of sure and rapid observation, took it all in at a glance, and having run over the groups, his eye rested on a man in front of him. This man, seated upon a stool, scarcely showed his head above the counter that sheltered him. He was about forty years of age, with a melancholy aspect, pale face, and soft, luminous eyes. He was looking at D'Artagnan and the rest, with his chin resting upon his hand, like a calm and inquiring amateur. Only on perceiving and doubtless recognizing our captain, he pulled his hat down over his eyes. It was this action, perhaps, that attracted D'Artagnan's attention. If so, the gentleman who had pulled down his hat produced an effect entirely different from what he had desired. In other respects his costume was plain, and his hair evenly cut enough for customers, who were not close observers, to take him for a mere tailor's apprentice, perched behind the board, and carefully stitching cloth or velvet. Nevertheless, this man held up his head too often to be very productively employed with his fingers. D'Artagnan was not deceived. Not he, and he saw at once that if this man was working at anything, it certainly was not at velvet. Eh, hey, said he, addressing this man, and so you have become a tailor's boy, Monsieur Moliere. Hush, Monsieur D'Artagnan replied the man softly, you will make them recognize me. Well, in what harm? The fact is, there is no harm, but you are going to say there is no good in doing it either, is it not so? Alas, no, for I was occupied in examining some excellent figures. Go on, go on, Monsieur Moliere. I quite understand the interest you take in the plates. I will not disturb your studies." thank you. But on one condition, that you tell me where Monsieur Percerin really is. Oh, willingly, in his own room, only, only that one can't enter it. Unapproachable. For everybody, everybody, he brought me here so that I might be at my ease to make my observations, and then he went away. Well, my dear Monsieur Moliere, but you will go and tell him I am here. I, exclaimed Moliere, in the tone of a courageous dog, 
from which you snatch the bone it has legitimately gained. I disturb myself? Ah, Monsieur d'Artagnan, how hard you are upon me! If you don't go directly and tell Monsieur Pesserin that I am here, my dear Moliere, said D'Artagnan in a low tone, I warn you of one thing, that I won't exhibit to you the friend I have brought with me. Moliere indicated Porthos by an imperceptible gesture. This gentleman, is it not? Yes. Moliere fixed upon Porthos one of those looks which penetrate the minds and hearts of men. The subject doubtless appeared a very promising one, for he immediately rose and led the way into the adjoining chamber. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Man in the Iron Mask」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Man in the Iron Mask by Alexandre Dumas Chapter Four The Patterns During all this time the noble mob was slowly heaving away, leaving at every angle of the counter either a murmur or a menace, as the waves leave foam or scattered seaweed on the sands, when they retire with the ebbing tide. In about ten minutes Moliere reappeared, making another sign to D'Artagnan from under the hangings. The latter hurried after him, with Porthos in the rear, and after threading a labyrinth of corridors, introduced him to Monsieur Pesserin's room. The old man, with his sleeves turned up, was gathering up in folds a piece of gold-flowered brocade, so as the better to exhibit its luster. Perceiving D'Artagnan, he put the silk aside, and came to meet him, by no means radiant with joy, and by no means courteous, but, take it altogether, in a tolerably civil manner. "'The captain of the king's musketeers will excuse me, I am sure, for I am engaged.' Hey. "'Yes, on the king's costumes. <laughs> I know that, my dear Monsieur Pesserin. You are making three, they tell me. Five, my dear sir, five. Three or five, tis all the same to me, my dear Monsieur, and I know that you will make them most exquisitely.' "'Yes, I know. Once made, they will be the most beautiful in the world. I do not deny it. But that they may be the most beautiful in the world, they must first be made.' And to do this, Captain, I am pressed for time. Oh, bah! There are two days yet. Tis much more than you require, Monsieur Pesserin, said D'Artagnan, in the coolest possible manner. Pesserin raised his head with the air of a man little accustomed to be contradicted, even in his whims. But D'Artagnan did not pay the least attention to the airs which the illustrious tailor began to assume. My dear Monsieur Pesserin, he continued, I bring you a customer. Ah, ha, exclaimed Percerin crossly. Monsieur le baron de Vallon de Bressieux et Pierrefonds, continued D'Artagnan. Percerin attempted a bow which found no favor in the eyes of the terrible Porthos, who, from his first entry into the room, had been regarding the tailor askance. A very good friend of mine concluded d'artagnan i will attend to monsieur said percerin but later later but when when i have time you have already told my valet as much broke in porthos discontentedly very likely said percerin i am nearly always pushed for time my friend returned Porthos sententiously. There is always time to be found when one chooses to seek it. Percerin turned crimson, an ominous sign indeed, in old men blanched by age. Monsieur is quite at liberty to confer his custom elsewhere. Come, come, Percerin, interposed D'Artagnan. You are not in a good temper to-day. Well, I will say one more word to you, which will bring you on your knees. Monsieur is not only a friend of mine, but more, a friend of Monsieur Fouquet's. Ah, ah, exclaimed the tailor. 
"'That is another thing.' Then, turning to Porthos, "'Monsieur le Baron is attached to the superintendent?' he inquired. "'I am attached to myself!' shouted Porthos, at the very moment that the tapestry was raised to introduce a new speaker in the dialogue. Moliere was all observation. D'Artagnan laughed. Porthos swore. <laughs> <laughs> "'My dear Perserin," said D'Artagnan, "'you will make a dress for the baron. "'Tis I who ask you.' "'To you I will not say nay, Captain.' "'But that is not all. "'You will make it for him at once.' "'Tis impossible within eight days.' "'That, then, is as much as to refuse, "'because the dress is wanted for the fete at Vaux.' "'I repeat that it is impossible,' "'returned the obstinate old man. "'By no means, my dear Monsieur Percerin, "'above all if I ask you,' "'said a mild voice at the door, "'a silvery voice which made D'Artagnan prick up his ears.' It was the voice of Aramis. "'Monsieur d'Herblay!' cried the tailor. "'Aramis!' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Ah! Our bishop!' said Porthos. "'Good morning, D'Artagnan. Good morning, Porthos. Good morning, my dear friends,' said Aramis. "'Come, come, Monsieur Passerin, make the baron's dress, and I will answer for it. You will gratify Monsieur Fouquet.' and he accompanied the words with a sign which seemed to say, Agree, and dismiss them. It appeared that Aramis had over Master Percerin an influence superior even to D'Artagnan's, for the tailor bowed in assent, and turning round upon Porthos, said, Go and get measured on the other side. Porthos coloured in a formidable manner. D'Artagnan saw the storm coming, and addressing Moliere, said to him in an undertone, you see before you, my dear monsieur, a man who considers himself disgraced if you measure the flesh and bones that heaven has given him. Study this type for me, Master Aristophanes, and profit by it. Moliere had no need of encouragement, and his gaze dwelt long and keenly on the baron Porthos. Monsieur, he said, if you will come with me, I will make them take your measure without touching you. Oh! said Porthos. How do you make that out, my friend? I say that they shall apply neither line nor rule to the seams of your dress. It is a new method we have invented for measuring people of quality, who are too sensitive to allow low-born fellows to touch them. We know some susceptible people who will not put up with being measured, a process which, as I think, wounds the natural dignity of a man." and if perchance monsieur should be one of these corboeuf i believe i am too well that is a capital and most consolatory coincidence and you shall have the benefit of our invention but how in the world can it be done asked porthos delighted monsieur said moliere bowing if you will deign to follow me you will see aramis observed this scene with all his eyes Perhaps he fancied from D'Artagnan's liveliness that he would leave with Porthos, so as not to lose the conclusion of a scene well begun. But, clear-sighted as he was, Aramis deceived himself. Porthos and Moliere left together. D'Artagnan remained with Percerin. Why? From curiosity, doubtless, probably to enjoy a little longer the society of his good friend Aramis. As Moliere and Porthos disappeared, D'Artagnan drew near the Bishop of Vannes, a proceeding which appeared particularly to disconcert him. "'A dress for you also, is it not, my friend?' Aramis smiled. "'No,' said he. "'You will go to Vaux, however?' "'I shall go, but without a new dress. You forget, dear D'Artagnan, that a poor Bishop of Vannes is not rich enough to have new dresses for every fete.' Bah, said the musketeer laughing and do we write no more poems now either oh d'artagnan exclaimed aramis i have long ago given up all such tomfoolery true repeated d'artagnan only half convinced as for percerin he was once more absorbed in contemplation of the brocades 
"'Don't you perceive,' said Aramis, smiling, "'that we are greatly boring this good gentleman, my dear D'Artagnan.' "'Ah!' murmured the musketeer, aside. "'That is, I am boring you, my friend.' <laughs> then aloud, "'Well, then, let us leave. I have no further business here, and if you are as disengaged as I, Aramis—' "'No, not I. I wished—' "'Ah, you had something particular to say to Monsieur Pesserin. Why did you not tell me so at once?' "'Something particular, certainly,' repeated Aramis, "'but not for you, D'Artagnan. But at the same time I hope you will believe that I can never have anything so particular to say that a friend like you may not hear it.' "'Oh, no, no, I'm going.' said d'artagnan imparting to his voice an evident tone of curiosity for aramis's annoyance well dissembled as it was had not a whit escaped him and he knew that in that impenetrable mind every thing even the most apparently trivial was designed to some end an unknown one but an end that from the knowledge he had of his friend's character the musketeer felt must be important on his part Aramis saw that D'Artagnan was not without suspicion, and pressed him. "'Stay, by all means,' he said. "'This is what it is.' Then, turning towards the tailor, "'My dear Percerin, said he, "'I am even very happy that you are here, D'Artagnan.' "'Oh, indeed!' exclaimed the Gascon, for the third time, even less deceived this time than before. Percerin never moved." Aramis roused him violently, by snatching from his hands the stuff upon which he was engaged. "'My dear Percerin, said he, "'I have near hand Monsieur Lebrun, one of Monsieur Fouquet's painters.' "'Ah, very good,' thought D'Artagnan. "'But why Lebrun?' Aramis looked at D'Artagnan, who seemed to be occupied with an engraving of Mark Antony. "'And you wish that I should make him a dress?' similar to those of the epicureans answered percerin and while saying this in an absent manner the worthy tailor endeavoured to recapture his piece of brocade an epicurean's dress asked d'artagnan in a tone of inquiry i see said aramis with a most engaging smile it is written that our dear d'artagnan shall know all our secrets this evening "'Yes, friend, you have surely heard speak of Monsieur Fouquet's Epicureans, have you not?' "'Undoubtedly. Is it not a kind of poetical society, of which La Fontaine, Loré, Pelisson, and Moliere are members, and which holds its sittings at Saint-Mande?' "'Exactly so. Well, we are going to put our poets in uniform, and enroll them in a regiment for the king.' oh very well i understand a surprise monsieur fouquet is getting up for the king <laughs> be at ease if that is the secret about monsieur lebrun i will not mention it always agreeable my friend no monsieur lebrun has nothing to do with this part of it the secret which concerns him is far more important than the other then if it is so important as all that i prefer not to know it said d'artagnan making a show of departure come in monsieur lebrun come in said aramis opening a side door with his right hand and holding back d'artagnan with his left in faith too i am quite in the dark quoth percerin aramis took an opportunity as is said in theatrical matters my dear monsieur de percerin aramis continued you are making five dresses for the king, are you not? One in brocade, one in hunting cloth, one in velvet, one in satin, and one in Florentine stuffs. Yes, but how, how do you know all that, Monseigneur? said Percerin, astounded. It is all very simple, my dear monsieur. There will be a hunt, a banquet, concert, promenade, and reception. These five kinds of dress are required by etiquette. You know everything, Monseigneur. And a thing or two in addition, muttered D'Artagnan. But, cried the tailor in triumph, what you do not know, Monseigneur, prince of the church though you are, 
what nobody will know, what only the king, Mademoiselle de la Valliere, and myself do know, is the color of the materials and nature of the ornaments, and the cut, the ensemble, and the finish of it all. Well, said Aramis, that is precisely what I have come to ask you, dear Percerin. Bah! Bah! exclaimed the tailor, terrified, though Aramis had pronounced these words in his softest and most honeyed tones. The request appeared, on reflection, so exaggerated, so ridiculous, so monstrous, to M. Percerin, that first he laughed to himself, then aloud, and finished with a shout. D'Artagnan followed his example, not because he found the matter so very funny, but in order not to allow Aramis to cool. At the outset I appear to be hazarding an absurd question, do I not? said Aramis. But D'Artagnan, who is incarnate wisdom itself, will tell you that I could not do this otherwise than ask you this. Let us see, said the attentive musketeer, perceiving with his wonderful instinct that they had only been skirmishing till now, and that the hour of battle was approaching. Let us see, said Percerin incredulously. Why now, continued Aramis, does M. Fouquet give the king a fete? Is it not to please him? Assuredly, said Percerin. D'Artagnan nodded assent. By delicate attentions, by some happy device, by a succession of surprises like that of which we are talking, the enrollment of our Epicureans. Admirable. Well, then, this is the surprise we intend. Monsieur Le Brun here is a man who draws most excellently. Yes, said Percerin, I have seen his pictures and observed that his dresses were highly elaborated. That is why I at once agreed to make him a costume, whether to agree with those of the Epicureans or an original one. My dear monsieur, we accept your offer, and shall presently avail ourselves of it. But just now, monsieur Lebrun is not in want of the dresses you will make for himself, but of those you are making for the king. Percerin made a bound backwards, which D'Artagnan, calmest and most appreciative of men, did not consider overdone, so many strange and startling aspects wore the proposal which Aramis had just hazarded. "'The king's dresses? Give the king's dresses to any mortal whatever! Oh, for once, Monseigneur, your grace is mad!' cried the poor tailor in extremity. "'Help me now, D'Artagnan,' said Aramis, more and more calm and smiling. "'Help me now to persuade, monsieur, for you understand do you not? Eh, eh, not exactly, I declare. What? You do not understand that Monsieur Fouquet wishes to afford the king the surprise of finding his portrait on his arrival at Vaux, and that the portrait, which be a striking resemblance, ought to be dressed exactly as the king will be on the day it is shown? Oh, yes, yes, said the musketeer, nearly convinced, so plausible was this reasoning. Yes, my dear Aramis, you are right. It is a happy idea. I will wager it is one of your own, Aramis. Well, I don't know, replied the bishop, either mine or Monsieur Fouquet's. Then scanning Percerin, after noticing D'Artagnan's hesitation, Well, Monsieur Percerin, he asked, what do you say to this? I say that, that you are doubtless free to refuse. I know well, and I by no means count upon compelling you, my dear monsieur. I will say more. I even understand all the delicacy you feel in taking up with Monsieur Fouquet's idea. You dread appearing to flatter the king. A noble spirit, Monsieur Pesserin, a noble spirit. The tailor stammered. It would indeed be a very pretty compliment to pay the young prince, continued Aramis, but as the superintendent told me, if Percerin refuse, 
tell him that it will not at all lower him in my opinion, and I shall always esteem him only... Only? repeated Percerin, rather troubled. Only, continued Aramis, I shall be compelled to say to the king, You understand, my dear Monsieur Percerin, that these are Monsieur Fouquet's words? I shall be constrained to say to the king, Sire, I had intended to present your majesty with your portrait, but owing to a feeling of delicacy, slightly exaggerated perhaps, although creditable, Monsieur Percerin opposed the project. Opposed? cried the tailor, terrified at the responsibility which would weigh upon him. I, to oppose the desire, the will of Monsieur Fouquet, when he is seeking to please the king. Oh, what a hateful word you have uttered, Monseigneur! Oppose! Oh, tis not I who said it. Heaven have mercy on me. I call the captain of the musketeers to witness it. Is it not true, Monsieur d'Artagnan, that I have opposed nothing? D'Artagnan made a sign, indicating he wished to remain neutral. He felt that there was an intrigue at the bottom of it, whether comedy or tragedy, he was at his wit's end at not being able to fathom it, but in the meanwhile wished to keep clear. But already Percerin, goaded by the idea that the king was to be told he stood in the way of a pleasant surprise, had offered Le Brun a chair, and proceeded to bring from a wardrobe four magnificent dresses, the fifth being still in the workman's hands and these masterpieces he successively fitted upon four lay figures, which, imported into France in the time of Concini, had been given to Percerin II by Marshal Donor. after the discomfiture of the Italian tailors ruined in their competition. The painter set to work to draw, and then to paint the dresses. But Aramis, who was closely watching all the phases of his toil, suddenly stopped him. I think you have not quite got it, my dear Lebrun, he said. Your colors will deceive you, and on canvas we shall lack that exact resemblance which is absolutely requisite. Time is necessary for attentively observing the finer shades. Quite true, said Percerin, but time is wanting, and on that head you will agree with me, Monseigneur, I can do nothing." "'Then the affair will fail,' said Aramis quietly, "'and that because of a want of precision in the colours. Nevertheless, Le Brun went on copying the materials and ornaments with the closest fidelity, a process which Aramis watched with ill-concealed impatience. "'What in the world now is the meaning of this imbroglio? the musketeer kept saying to himself. "'That will never do.' said Aramis. Monsieur Le Brun, close your box, and roll up your canvas. But, monsieur, cried the vexed painter, the light is abominable here. An idea, monsieur Le Brun, an idea. If we had a pattern of the materials, for example, and with time, at a better light. Oh, then, cried Le Brun, I would answer for the effect. Good, said D'Artagnan. This ought to be the knotty point of the whole thing. They want a pattern of each of the materials. Mordieu! Will this Percerin give in now? Percerin, beaten from his last retreat, and duped, moreover, by the feigned good nature of Aramis, cut out five patterns and handed them to the Bishop of Vannes. I like this better. That is your opinion, is it not? said Aramis to D'Artagnan. My dear Aramis, said D'Artagnan, my opinion is that you are always the same. <laughs> and consequently, always your friend, said the bishop in a charming tone. Yes, yes, said D'Artagnan aloud, then in a low voice, if I am your dupe, double Jesuit that you are, I will not be your accomplice, and to prevent it, tis time I left this place. Adieu, Aramis, he added aloud. Adieu, I am going to rejoin Porthos. Then wait for me, said Aramis, pocketing the patterns. 
for I have done, and shall be glad to say a parting word to our dear old friend. Lebrun packed up his paints and brushes, Perserin put back the dresses into the closet, Aramis put his hand on his pocket to assure himself the patterns were secure, and they all left the study. End of chapter Chapter Five of The Man in the Iron Mask. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Man in the Iron Mask by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Five Where, probably, Moliere obtained his first idea of the bourgeois gentilhomme. D'Artagnan found Porthos in the adjoining chamber but no longer an irritated Porthos, or a disappointed Porthos, but Porthos radiant, blooming, fascinating, and chattering with Moliere, who was looking upon him with a species of idolatry, and as a man would who had not only never seen anything greater, but not even ever anything so great. Aramis went straight up to Porthos and offered him his white hand, which lost itself in the gigantic clasp of his old friend an operation which Aramis never hazarded without a certain uneasiness. But the friendly pressure having been performed not too painfully for him, the Bishop of Vannes passed over to Moliere. "'Well, monsieur,' said he, "'will you come with me to saint mande "'I will go anywhere you like, monseigneur,' answered Moliere. "'To saint mande cried Porthos, surprised at seeing the proud bishop of Vannes fraternizing with a journeyman tailor. "'What, Aramis, are you going to take this gentleman to saint mande "'Yes,' said Aramis, smiling, "'our work is pressing.' "'And besides, my dear Porthos,' continued D'Artagnan, "'Monsieur Moliere is not altogether what he seems.' "'In what way?' asked Porthos." Why, this gentleman is one of Monsieur Percerin's chief clerks, and is expected at saint mande to try on the dresses which Monsieur Fouquet has ordered for the Epicureans. "'Tis precisely so,' said Moliere. "'Yes, monsieur.' "'Come, then, my dear Monsieur Moliere,' said Aramis. "'That is, if you have done with Monsieur de Vallon.' "'We have finished,' replied Porthos." "'And you are satisfied?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Completely so,' replied Porthos. Moliere took his leave of Porthos with much ceremony, and grasped the hand which the captain of the musketeers furtively offered him. "'Pray, monsieur,' concluded Porthos, mincingly, "'above all, be exact.' "'You will have your dress the day after to-morrow, monsieur le baron,' answered Moliere and he left with Aramis. Then D'Artagnan, taking Porthos's arm, "'What has this tailor done for you, my dear Porthos?' he asked, "'that you are so pleased with him.' "'What has he done for me, my friend? <laughs> "'Done for me!' cried Porthos enthusiastically. "'Yes, I ask you, what has he done for you?' "'My friend, he has done that which no tailor ever yet accomplished. "'He has taken my measure without touching me. Ah, bah, tell me how he did it. First, then, they went, I don't know where, for a number of lay figures, of all heights and sizes, hoping there would be one to suit mine, but the largest, that of the drum-major of the Swiss Guard, was two inches too short, and a half-foot too narrow in the chest. Indeed. It is exactly as I tell you, D'Artagnan, but he is a great man, or at the very least a great tailor is this Monsieur Moliere. He was not at all put at fault by the circumstance. What did he do, then? Oh, it is a very simple matter. In faith, it is an unheard-of thing that people should have been so stupid as not to have discovered this method from the first. What annoyance and humiliation they would have spared me! Not to mention of the costumes, my dear Porthos. Yes, thirty dresses. Well, my dear Porthos, 
come, tell me Monsieur Moliere's plan. Moliere? You call him so, do you? I shall make a point of recollecting his name. Yes, or Poquelin, if you prefer that. No, I like Moliere best. When I wish to recollect his name, I shall think of Voliere, which is an aviary. And as I have one at Pierrefonds, Capital, returned D'Artagnan. And Monsieur Moliere's plan? Tis this. Instead of pulling me to pieces, as all these rascals do, of making me bend my back and double my joints, all of them low and dishonorable practices, D'Artagnan made a sign of approbation with his head. Monsieur, he said to me, continued Porthos, a gentleman ought to measure himself. Do me the pleasure to draw near this glass. And I drew near the glass. I must own I did not exactly understand what this good Monsieur Voliere wanted with me. Moliere. Ah, yes, Moliere. Moliere. And as the fear of being measured still possessed me, take care, said I to him, what you are going to do with me. I am very ticklish, I warn you. But he, with his soft voice, for he is a courteous fellow, we must admit, my friend, he, with his soft voice, Monsieur, said he, that your dress may fit you well, it must be made according to your figure. Your figure is exactly reflected in this mirror. We shall take the measure of this reflection. In fact, said D'Artagnan, you saw yourself in the glass, but where did they find one in which you could see your whole figure? My good friend, it is the very glass in which the king is used to look to see himself. Yes, but the king is a foot and a half shorter than you are. Ah, well, I know not how that may be. It is, no doubt, a cunning way of flattering the king, but the looking-glass was too large for me. Tis true that its height was made up of three Venetian plates of glass, placed one above another, and its breadth of three similar parallelograms in juxtaposition. Oh, Porthos, what excellent words you have command of! Where in the world did you acquire such a voluminous vocabulary? At Belle-Isle. Aramis and I had to use such words in our strategic studies and castramentative experiments. D'Artagnan recoiled, as though the sesquipedalian syllables had knocked the breath out of his body. Ah, very good. Let us return to the looking-glass, my friend. Then this good Monsieur Voliere, Moliere. Yes, Moliere, you are right. You will see now, my dear friend, that I shall recollect his name quite well. This excellent Monsieur Moliere set to work tracing out lines on the mirror with a piece of Spanish chalk, following on all the make of my arms and my shoulders, all the while expounding this maxim, which I thought admirable. It is advisable that a dress should not incommode its wearer. In reality said d'artagnan that is an excellent maxim which is unfortunately seldom carried out in practice that is why i found it all the more astonishing when he expatiated upon it ah he expatiated parbleu let me hear his theory seeing that he continued one may in awkward circumstances or in a troublesome position have one's doublet on one's shoulder, and not desire to take one's doublet off. True, said D'Artagnan. And so, continued Monsieur Voliere, Moliere, Moliere, yes. And so, went on Monsieur Moliere, you want to draw your sword, Monsieur, and you have your doublet on your back. What do you do? I take it off, I answered. Well, no, he replied. How no? I say that the dress should be so well made that it will in no way encumber you, even in drawing your sword. Ha! Ha! Throw yourself on guard, pursued he. I did it with such wondrous firmness that two panes of glass burst out of the window. Tis nothing, nothing, said he. Keep your position. I raised my left arm in the air, the forearm gracefully bent, 
the ruffle drooping, and my wrist curved, while my right arm, half extended, securely covered my wrist with the elbow, and my breast with the wrist. Yes, said D'Artagnan, tis the true guard, the academic guard. You have said the very word, dear friend. In the meanwhile, Voliere, Moliere, hold. I should certainly, after all, prefer to call him. What did you say his other name was? Poquelin. I prefer to call him Poquelin. And how will you remember this name better than the other? You understand, he calls himself Poquelin, does he not? Yes. If I were to call to mind Madame Coquenard. Good. And change Coq into Poc, Nard into Lin, and instead of Coquenard I shall have Poquelin. Tis wonderful, cried D'Artagnan, astounded. Go on, my friend, I am listening to you with admiration. This Coquelin sketched my arm on the glass. I beg your pardon, Poquelin. What did I say, then? You said Coquelin. Ha! True. This Poquelin, then, sketched my arm on the glass. But he took his time over it. He kept looking at me a good deal. The fact is that I must have been looking particularly handsome. Does it weary you? He asked. A little, I replied, bending a little in my hands. But I could hold out for an hour or so longer? No, no, I will not allow it. The willing fellows will make it a duty to support your arms, as of old. Men supported those of the prophet. Very good, I answered. That will not be humiliating to you? My friend, said I, there is, I think, a great difference between being supported and being measured. The distinction is full of the soundest sense, interrupted D'Artagnan. Then continued Porthos. He made a sign. Two lads approached, one supported my left arm, while the other, with infinite address, supported my right. "'Another, my man!' cried he. A third approached. "'Support, monsieur, by the waist,' said he. The garçon complied. "'So that you were at rest?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Perfectly. And Poquenard drew me on the glass.' Poquelin, my friend. Poquelin, you are right. Stay. Decidedly, I prefer calling him Voliere. Yes. And then it was over, wasn't it? During that time, Voliere drew me as I appeared in the mirror. Twas delicate in him. I much like the plan. It is respectful and keeps every one in his place. And there it ended? Without a soul having touched me, my friend except the three garçons who supported you? Doubtless, but I have, I think, already explained to you the difference there is between supporting and measuring. "'Tis true," answered D'Artagnan, who said afterwards to himself, "'In faith I greatly deceive myself, or I have been the means of a good windfall to that rascal Moliere, and we shall assuredly see the scene hit off to the life, in some comedy or other.' Porthos smiled. "'What are you laughing at?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Must I confess? Well, I was laughing over my good fortune.' "'Oh, that is true. I don't know a happier man than you. But what is this last piece of luck that has befallen you?' "'Well, my dear fellow, congratulate me. I desire nothing better.' It seems that I am the first who has had his measure taken in that manner. Are you so sure of it? Nearly so. Certain signs of intelligence which pass between Voliere and the other garçons show me the fact. Well, my friend, that does not surprise me from Moliere, said D'Artagnan. Voliere, my friend. Oh, no, no, indeed. I am very willing to leave you to go on saying Voliere, but as for me, I shall continue to say Moliere. Well, this, I was saying, does not surprise me, coming from Moliere, who is a very ingenious fellow, and inspired you with this grand idea. It will be of great use to him by and by, I am sure. 
won't it be of use to him indeed? I believe you it will, and that in the highest degree, for you see my friend Moliere is of all known tailors the man who best clothes our barons, comtes, and marquises, according to their measure. On this observation, neither the application nor depth of which we shall discuss, D'Artagnan and Porthos quitted Monsieur de Pesserin's house, and rejoined their carriages, wherein we will leave them, in order to look after Moliere and Aramis at Saint-Mande. End of chapter. Chapter Six of *The Man in the Iron Mask*. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. *The Man in the Iron Mask* by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Six: The Beehive, the Bees, and the Honey. The Bishop of Vannes, much annoyed at having met D'Artagnan at Monsieur Pesserin's returned to saint in no very good humour. Moliere, on the other hand, quite delighted at having made such a capital rough sketch, and at knowing where to find the original again, whenever he should desire to convert his sketch into a picture, Moliere arrived in the merriest of moods. All the first story of the left wing was occupied by the most celebrated Epicureans in Paris, and those on the freest footing in the house, every one in his compartment, like the bees in their cells, employed in producing the honey intended for that royal cake which M. Fouquet proposed to offer His Majesty Louis the Fourteenth during the fete at Vaux. Pelisson, his head leaning on his hand, was engaged in drawing out the plan of the prologue to the Facheux, a comedy in three acts, which was to be put on the stage by Poquelin de Molière, as D'Artagnan called him, or Coquelin de Folière, as Porthos styled him. Loret, with all the charming innocence of a gazetteer, the gazetteers of all ages have always been so artless, Loret was composing an account of the fêtes at Vaux, before those fêtes had taken place. La Fontaine sauntered about from one to the other, a peripatetic, absent-minded, boring, unbearable dreamer, who kept buzzing and humming at everybody's elbow a thousand poetic abstractions. He so often disturbed Pelisson that the latter, raising his head, crossly said, "'At least, La Fontaine, supply me with a rhyme, since you have the run of the gardens at Panassus.' "'What rhyme do you want?' asked the fabler, as Madame de Savine used to call him. "'I want a rhyme to Lumière.' "'Ornière!' answered La Fontaine. Ah, but my good friend, one cannot talk of wheel-ruts when celebrating the delights of Vaux, said Loret. Besides, it doesn't rhyme, answered Pelisson. What, doesn't rhyme? cried La Fontaine in surprise. Yes, you have an abominable habit, my friend, a habit which will ever prevent your becoming a poet of the first order. You rhyme in a slovenly manner. Oh, oh, you think so, do you, Pelisson? Yes, I do, indeed. Remember that a rhyme is never good so long as one can find a better. Then I will never write anything again save in prose, said La Fontaine, who had taken up Pelisson's reproach in earnest. Ah, I often suspected I was nothing but a rascally poet. Yes, tis the very truth. Do not say so. Your remark is too sweeping, and there is much that is good in your fables. And to begin, continued La Fontaine, following up his idea, I will go and burn a hundred verses I have just made. Where are your verses? In my head. Well, if they are in your head, you cannot burn them. True, said La Fontaine, but if I do not burn them... Well, what will happen if you do not burn them? They will remain in my mind, and I shall never forget them. The deuce! cried Loret. What a dangerous thing! One would go mad with it. The deuce! The deuce! repeated La Fontaine. What can I do? I have discovered the way, 
said Moliere, who had entered just at this point of the conversation. "'What way?' "'Write them first, and burn them afterwards.' "'How simple! Well, I should never have discovered that. What a mind that devil of a Moliere has!' said La Fontaine. Then, striking his forehead, "'Oh, thou wilt never be aught but an ass, Jean La Fontaine,' he added. "'What are you saying there, my friend?' broke in Moliere, approaching the poet, whose aside he had heard. "'I say I shall never be aught but an ass,' answered La Fontaine, with a heavy sigh and swimming eyes. "'Yes, my friend,' he added, with increasing grief, "'it means that I rhyme in a slovenly manner.' "'Oh, tis wrong to say so.' "'Nay, I am a poor creature.' Who said so? Pablo, t'was Pelisson, did you not, Pelisson? Pelisson, again absorbed in his work, took good care not to answer. But if Pelisson said you were so, cried Meliere, Pelisson has seriously offended you. Do you think so? Ah, I advise you, as you are a gentleman, not to leave an insult like that unpunished. What? exclaimed La Fontaine. Did you ever fight? Once only, with the lieutenant in the light horse. What wrong had he done you? It seems he ran away with my wife. Ah! Ah! said Moliere, becoming slightly pale, but as, at La Fontaine's declaration, the others had turned round, Moliere kept upon his lips the rallying smile which had so nearly died away, and continuing to make La Fontaine speak. And what was the result of the duel? The result was that on the ground my opponent disarmed me, and then made an apology, promising never again to set foot in my house. And you consider yourself satisfied? said Moliere. Not at all. On the contrary, I picked up my sword. I beg your pardon, monsieur, I said. I have not fought you because you were my wife's friend, but because I was told I ought to fight. So, as I have never known any peace, save since you made her acquaintance, do me the pleasure to continue your visits as heretofore, or, more blur, let us set to again. And so, continued La Fontaine, he was compelled to resume his friendship with Madame, and I continue to be the happiest of husbands. <laughs> All burst out laughing. Moliere alone passed his hand across his eyes. Why? perhaps to wipe away a tear, perhaps to smother a sigh. Alas, we know that Moliere was a moralist, but he was not a philosopher. "'Tis all one,' he said, returning to the topic of the conversation. "'Pelisson has insulted you.' "'Ah, truly, I had already forgotten it.' "'And I am going to challenge him on your behalf.' "'Well, you can do so, if you think it indispensable.' "'I do.' do think it indispensable, and I am going to—' "'Stay!' exclaimed La Fontaine. "'I want your advice.' "'Upon what? This insult?' "'No, tell me really now whether Lumière does not rhyme with Ornière.' "'I should make them rhyme. Ah, I knew you would. And I have made a hundred thousand such rhymes in my time.' "'A hundred thousand! cried La Fontaine, four times as many as La Pucelle, which M. Chaplain is meditating. Is it also on this subject, too, that you have composed a hundred thousand verses? Listen to me, you eternally absent-minded creature, said Moliere. It is certain, continued La Fontaine, that legume, for instance, rhymes with postum. In the plural above all. Yes, above all in the plural, seeing that then it rhymes not with three letters, but with four, as Ornière does with Lumière. But give me Ornière and Lumière in the plural, my dear Pelisson, said La Fontaine, clapping his hand on the shoulder of his friend, whose insult he had quite forgotten, and they will rhyme. Hem! <laughs> coughed Pelisson. Moliere says so, and Moliere is a judge of such things. He declares he has himself made a hundred thousand verses. Come, 
said Moliere, laughing. He is off now. It is like rivage, which rhymes admirably with herbage. I would take my oath of it. But, said Moliere, I tell you all this, continued La Fontaine, because you are preparing a divertissement for Vaux, are you not? Yes, the fâcheur. Oh, yes, the fâcheur, yes, I recollect. Well, I was thinking a prologue would admirably suit your divertissement. Doubtless it would suit capitally. Ah, you are of my opinion? So much so that I have asked you to write this very prologue. You asked me to write it? Yes, you, and on your refusal begged you to ask Pelisson, who is engaged upon it at this moment. Ah, that is what Pelisson is doing, then. In faith, my dear Moliere, you are indeed often right. When? When you call me absent-minded. It is a monstrous defect. I will cure myself of it and do your prologue for you. But inasmuch as Pelisson is about it. Ah, true, miserable rascal that I am. Loire was indeed right in saying I was a poor creature. It was not Loire who said so, my friend. Well, then, whoever said so, tis the same to me. And so your divertissement is called the fâcheur? Well, can you make heureux rhyme with fâcheur? If obliged, yes. And even with capriceur? Oh, no, no. It would be hazardous, and yet why so? There is too great a difference in the cadences. I was fancying, said La Fontaine, leaving Moliere for Loire, I was fancying, oh, what were you fancying, said Loire in the middle of a sentence, make haste. You are writing the prologue to the Fâcheur, are you not? No, mon Dieu, it is Pelisson. Ah, Pelisson, cried La Fontaine, going over to him. I was fancying, he continued, that the nymph of Vaux, ah, beautiful, cried Loire, the nymph of Vaux. Thank you, La Fontaine. You have just given me the two concluding verses of my paper. Well, if you can rhyme so well, La Fontaine, said Pelisson, tell me now in what way you would begin my prologue. I should say, for instance, O oh, nymph who... Uh, after who I should place a verb in the second person singular of the present indicative, and should go on thus, this grot profound. But the verb, the verb, asked Pelisson. To admire the greatest king of all kings round, continued La Fontaine. But the verb, the verb, obstinately insisted Pelisson. This second person in singular of the present indicative? Well, then, quittest. O oh, nymph, who quittest now this groat profound, to admire the greatest king of all kings round. You would not put who quittest, would you? Why not? Quittest after you who? Ah, my dear fellow, exclaimed La Fontaine, you are a shocking pedant. Without counting, said Moliere, that the second verse, King of all kings round, is very weak, my dear La Fontaine. Then you see I am nothing but a poor creature, a shuffler, as you said. I never said so. Then as Loire said. And it was not Loire either, it was Pelisson. Well, Pelisson was right a hundred times over, but what annoys me more than anything, my dear Moliere, is that I fear we shall not have our Epicurean dresses. You expected yours, then, for the fete? Yes, for the fete, and then for after the fete. My housekeeper told me that my own is rather faded. Diable! Your housekeeper is right, rather more than faded. Ah, you see returned La Fontaine. The fact is, I left it on the floor in my room, and my cat. Well, your cat? She made her nest upon it. 
which has rather changed its color. Moliere burst out laughing. Pelisson and Locre followed his example. At this juncture the Bishop of Vannes appeared, with a roll of plans and parchments under his arm. As if the angel of death had chilled all gay and sprightly fancies, as if that wan form had scared away the graces to whom Xenocrates sacrificed, silence immediately reigned through the study, and every one resumed his self-possession and his pen. Aramis distributed the notes of invitation, and thanked them in the name of M. Fouquet. The superintendent, he said, being kept to his room by business, could not come and see them, but begged them to send him some of the fruits of their day's work, to enable him to forget the fatigue of his labour in the night. At these words all settled down to work. La Fontaine placed himself at a table, and set his rapid pen an endless dance across the smooth white vellum. Pelisson made a fair copy of his prologue. Moliere contributed fifty fresh verses, with which his visit to Perserin had inspired him. Loire, an article on the marvellous fetes he predicted, and Aramis, laden with his booty like the king of the bees, that great black drone, decked with purple and gold, re-entered his apartment, silent and busy. But before departing, "'Remember, gentlemen,' said he, "'we leave to-morrow evening.' "'In that case I must give notice at home,' said Moliere. "'Yes, poor Moliere,' said Loire, smiling. "'He loves his home.' "'He loves, yes,' replied Moliere, with his sad, sweet smile. "'He loves. That does not mean they love him.' "'As for me,' said La Fontaine, they love me at Chateau Thierry, I am very sure. Aramis here re-entered after a brief disappearance. Will any one go with me? he asked. I am going by Paris, after having passed a quarter of an hour with Monsieur Fouquet. I offer my carriage. Good, said Moliere. I accept it. I am in a hurry. I shall dine here, said Loret. Monsieur de Gourville has promised me some crawfish. He has promised me some whitings. Find a rhyme for that, La Fontaine. Aramis went out laughing, as only he could laugh, and Moliere followed him. They were at the bottom of the stairs when La Fontaine opened the door and shouted out, He has promised us some whitings in return for these our writings. The shouts of laughter reached the ears of Fouquet at the moment Aramis opened the door of his study. As to Moliere, he had undertaken to order the horses, while Aramis went to exchange a parting word with the superintendent. "'Oh, how they are laughing there!' said Fouquet, with a laugh. "'Do you not laugh, Monseigneur?' "'I laugh no longer now, Monsieur d'Herblay. The fête is approaching, money is departing. Have I not told you that that was my business?' "'Yes, you promise me millions.' "'You shall have them the day after the king's entree into Vaux.' Fouquet looked closely at Aramis, and passed the back of his icy hand across his moistened brow. Aramis perceived that the superintendent either doubted him, or felt he was powerless to obtain the money. How could Fouquet suppose that a poor bishop, ex-abbe, ex-musketeer, could find any? "'Why doubt me?' said Aramis. Fouquet smiled and shook his head. "'Man of little faith,' added the bishop. "'My dear Monsieur d'Herblay, answered Fouquet, "'if I fall—' "'Well, if you fall—' "'I shall at least fall from such a height "'that I shall shatter myself in falling.' "'Then giving himself a shake as though to escape from himself— "'Whence came you?' said he. "'My friend.' "'From Paris, from Perserin.' "'And what have you been doing at Perserin's? "'For I suppose you attach no great importance to our poet's dresses.' "'No, I went to prepare a surprise.' "'Surprise?' "'Yes, which you are going to give to the king.' "'And will it cost much?' Oh, a hundred pistoles you will give Lebrun. A painting, 
Ah, all the better. And what is this painting to represent? I will tell you. Then at the same time, whatever you may say or think of it, I went to see the dresses for our poets. Bah! And they will be rich and elegant? Splendid! There will be few great monseigneurs with so good. People will see the difference there is between the courtiers of wealth and those of friendship. Ever generous and grateful, dear prelate. In your school. Fouquet grasped his hand. And where are you going? he said. I am off to Paris, when you shall have given a certain letter. For whom? Monsieur de Lyon. And what do you want with Lyon? I wish to make him sign a lettre de cachet. Lettre de cachet? Do you desire to put somebody in the Bastille? On the contrary, to let somebody out. And who? A poor devil, a youth, a lad who has been Bastilled these ten years, for two Latin verses he made against the Jesuits. Two Latin verses? And for two Latin verses the miserable being has been imprisoned for ten years? Yes. And has committed no other crime? Beyond this, he is as innocent as you or I. On your word? On my honour. And his name is? Selden. Yes. Uh, but it is too bad. You knew this, and you never told me. "'Twas only yesterday his mother replied to me, Monseigneur. "'And the woman is poor. "'In the deepest misery. "'Heaven,' said Fouquet, "'sometimes bears with such injustice on earth "'that I hardly wonder there are wretches who doubt of its existence. "'Stay, Monsieur d'Herblay.' "'And Fouquet, taking a pen, wrote a few rapid lines to his colleague, Lyon. "'Aramis took the letter and made ready to go.' Wait, said Fouquet. He opened his drawer and took out ten government notes which were there, each for a thousand francs. Stay, he said. Set the son at liberty, and give this to the mother. But above all, do not tell her. What, Monseigneur? That she is ten thousand livres richer than I. She would say I am but a poor superintendent. Go, and I pray that God will bless those who are mindful of his poor. So also do I pray, replied Aramis, kissing Fouquet's hand. And he went out quickly, carrying off the letter for Lyon and the notes for Selden's mother, and taking up Moliere, who was beginning to lose patience. End of chapter Chapter Seven of the Man in the Iron Mask. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Man in the Iron Mask by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Seven Another Supper at the Bastille. Seven o'clock sounded from the great clock of the Bastille, that famous clock which like all the accessories of the state prison, the very use of which is a torture, recalled to the prisoners' minds the destination of every hour of their punishment. The timepiece of the Bastille, adorned with figures, like most of the clocks of the period, represented St. Peter in bonds. It was the supper hour of the unfortunate captives. The doors, grating on their enormous hinges, opened for the passage of the baskets and trays of provisions, the abundance and the delicacy of which, as M. de Baisemeaux has himself taught us, was regulated by the condition and life of the prisoner. We understand on this head the theories of M. de Baisemeaux, sovereign dispenser of gastronomic delicacies, head cook of the royal fortress, whose trays full laden were ascending the steep staircases, carrying some consolation to the prisoners in the shape of honestly filled bottles of good vintages. The same hour was that of Monsieur le Gouverneur's supper also. He had a guest to-day, and the spit turned more heavily than usual. Roast partridges, 
flanked with quails and flanking a larded leveret, boiled fowls, hams, fried and sprinkled with white wine, cardons of guipuscoa and la bisque et cravis, these, together with soups and hors d'oeuvres, constituted the governor's bill of fare. Baisemeaux, seated at table, was rubbing his hands and looking at the bishop of Vannes, who, booted like a cavalier, dressed in grey and sword at side, kept talking of his hunger and testifying the liveliest impatience. Monsieur de Baisemeaux de Montlezun was not accustomed to the unbending movements of his greatness, my lord of Vannes, and this evening Aramis, becoming sprightly, volunteered confidence on confidence. The prelate had again a little touch of the musketeer about him. The bishop just trenched on the borders only of license in his style of conversation. As for M. de Baisemeaux, with the facility of vulgar people, he gave himself up entirely upon this point of his guest's freedom. Monsieur, said he, for indeed to-night I dare not call you Monseigneur. By no means, said Aramis, call me Monsieur, I am booted. Do you know, Monsieur, of whom you remind me this evening? No, faith, said Aramis, taking up his glass, but I hope I remind you of a capital guest. You remind me of two, Monsieur. Francois, shut the window, the wind may annoy his greatness. And let him go, added Aramis. The supper is completely served, and we shall eat it very well without waiters. I like exceedingly to be tete-a-tete -tete when I am with a friend. Baisemeaux bowed respectfully. I like exceedingly, continued Aramis, to help myself. Retire, Francois, cried Baisemeaux. I was saying that your greatness puts me in mind of two persons, one very illustrious, the late cardinal, the great Cardinal de la Rochelle, who wore boots like you. Indeed, said Aramis, and the other. The other was a certain musketeer, very handsome, very brave, very adventurous, very fortunate, who from being abbe turned musketeer, and from musketeer turned abbe. Aramis condescended to smile. From abbe, continued Baisemeaux, encouraged by Aramis's smile, from abbe, bishop, and from bishop. Ah, stay there, I beg, exclaimed Aramis. I have just said, monsieur, that you gave me the idea of a cardinal. Enough, dear monsieur Baisemeaux. As you said, I have on the boots of a cavalier, but I do not intend for all that to embroil myself with the church this evening. But you have wicked intentions, nevertheless, monseigneur. Oh, yes, wicked, I own, as everything mundane is. You traverse the town and the streets in disguise? In disguise, as you say. And you still make use of your sword? Yes, I should think so, but only when I am compelled. Do me the pleasure to summon Francois. Have you no wine there? It is not for wine, but because it is hot here and the window is shut. I shut the windows at supper-time, so as not to hear the sounds of the arrival of couriers. Ah, yes, you hear them when the window is open? But too well, and that disturbs me. You understand? Nevertheless, I am suffocated. Francois. Francois entered. Open the windows, I pray you, Master Francois, said Aramis. You will allow him, dear Monsieur Baisemeaux? You are at home here, answered the governor. The window was opened. Do you not think, said Monsieur de Baisemeaux, that you will find yourself very lonely, now Monsieur de la Fere has returned to his household gods at Blois? He is a very old friend, is he not? You know it as I do, Baisemeaux, seeing that you were in the musketeers with us, Bah! With my friends I reckon neither bottles of wine nor years. And you are right. But I do more than love Monsieur de la Fere, dear Baisemeaux. I venerate him. 
"'Well, for my part, though tis singular,' said the governor, "'I prefer Monsieur d'Artagnan to him. "'There is a man for you, who drinks long and well. "'That kind of people allow you at least to penetrate their thoughts. "'Baisemeaux, make me tipsy to-night. "'Let us have a merry time of it as of old. "'And if I have a trouble at the bottom of my heart, I promise you, you shall see it as you would a diamond in the bottom of your glass. Bravo! said Baisemeaux, and he poured out a great glass of wine and drank it off at a draught, trembling with joy at the idea of being, by hook or by crook, in the secret of some high archiepiscopal misdemeanor. While he was drinking, he did not see with what attention Aramis was noting the sounds in the great court. A courier came in about eight o'clock, as Francois brought in the fifth bottle, and although the courier made a great noise, Baisemeaux heard nothing. "'The devil take him,' said Aramis. "'What? Who?' asked Baisemeaux. "'I hope tis neither the wine you drank, nor he who is the cause of your drinking it.' "'No, it is a horse who is making noise enough in the court for a whole squadron.' "'Pooh! Some courier or other,' replied the governor, redoubling his attention to the passing bottle. "'Yes, and may the devil take him, and so quickly that we shall never hear him speak more. Hurrah! Hurrah! "'You forget me, Baisemeaux. My glass is empty,' said Aramis, lifting his dazzling Venetian goblet. "'Upon my honour, you delight me. Francois, wine!' Francois entered. "'Wine, fellow, and better.' "'Yes, monsieur, yes, but a courier has just arrived.' "'Let him go to the devil, I say.' "'Yes, monsieur, but—' "'Let him leave his news at the office. We will see to it to-morrow. "'Tomorrow, there will be time to-morrow, there will be daylight,' said Baisemeaux, chanting the words. "'Ah, monsieur,' grumbled the soldier francois in spite of himself monsieur take care said aramis take care of what dear monsieur d'herblay said baisemeaux half intoxicated the letter which the courier brings to the governor of a fortress is sometimes an order nearly always do not orders issue from the ministers Yes, undoubtedly, but— And what do these ministers do but countersign the signature of the king? Perhaps you are right. Nevertheless, tis very tiresome when you are sitting before a good table, tete-a-tete -tete with a friend. Ah, I beg your pardon, monsieur. I forgot it is I who engage you at supper, and that I speak to a future cardinal. Let us pass over that, dear Baisemeaux and return to our soldier, to Francois. Well, and what has Francois done? He has demurred. He was wrong, then? However, he has demurred, you see. Tis because there is something extraordinary in this matter. It is very possible that it was not Francois who was wrong in demurring, but you, who are in the wrong in not listening to him. Wrong? I to be wrong before Francois? That seems rather hard. Pardon me, merely an irregularity, but I thought it my duty to make an observation which I deem important. Oh, oh, perhaps you are right, stammered Baisemeaux. The king's order is sacred, but as to orders that arrive when one is at supper, I repeat that the devil— if you had said as much to the great cardinal, <clears throat> my dear Baisemeaux, and if his order had any importance, I do it that I may not disturb a bishop. Mordieu! Am I not, then, excusable? Do not forget, Baisemeaux, that I have worn the soldier's coat, and I am accustomed to obedience everywhere. You wish, then? I wish that you would do your duty, my friend. "'Yes, at least before this soldier.' "'Tis mathematically true,' exclaimed Baisemeaux. Francois still waited. 
"'Let them send this order of the king's up to me,' he repeated, recovering himself. And he added in a low tone, "'Do you know what it is? I will tell you something about as interesting as this. Beware of fire near the powder magazine, or look close after such and such a one who is clever at escaping. Ha! <laughs> if you only knew, Monseigneur.' How many times I have been suddenly awakened from the very sweetest, deepest slumber, by messengers arriving at full gallop to tell me, or rather bring me a slip of paper containing these words, Monsieur de Baisemeaux, what news? Tis clear enough that those who waste their time writing such orders have never slept in the Bastille. They would know better. They have never considered the thickness of my walls, the vigilance of my officers, the number of rounds we go. But indeed, what can you expect, Monseigneur? It is their business to write and torment me when I am at rest, and to trouble me when I am happy, added Baisemeaux, bowing to Aramis. Then let them do their business. And do you do yours? added the bishop, smiling. Francois re-entered. Baisemeaux took from his hands the minister's order. He slowly undid it, and as slowly read it. Aramis pretended to be drinking, so as to be able to watch his host through the glass. Then, Baisemeaux, having read it, "'What was I just saying?' he exclaimed. "'What is it?' asked the bishop. "'An order of release. There, now, excellent news indeed to disturb us.' "'Excellent news for him whom it concerns, you will at least agree, my dear governor.' "'And at eight o'clock in the evening.' "'It is charitable.' "'Oh, charity is all very well, but it is for that fellow who says he is so weary and tired, but not for me who am amusing myself,' said Baisemeaux, exasperated. "'Will you lose by him, then?' And is the prisoner who is to be set at liberty a good payer? Oh, yes, indeed, a miserable five-franc rat. Let me see it, asked Monsieur d'Herblay. It is no indiscretion? By no means. Read it. There is urgent on the paper. You have seen that, I suppose. Oh, admirable, urgent. A man who has been there ten years. It is urgent to set him free to-day, this very evening, at eight o'clock. Urgent! And Baisemeaux, shrugging his shoulders with an air of supreme disdain, flung the order on the table and began eating again. They are fond of these tricks, he said with his mouth full. They seize a man some fine day, keep him under lock and key for ten years, and write to you, watch this fellow well, or keep him very strictly, and then, as soon as you are accustomed to look upon the prisoner as a dangerous man, all of a sudden, without rhyme or reason, they write, set him at liberty, and actually add to their missive, urgent. You will own, my lord, tis enough to make a man at dinner shrug his shoulders. What do you expect? It is for them to write, said Aramis, for you to execute the order. "'Good, good. Execute it. Oh, patience! You must not imagine that I am a slave.' "'Gracious heaven! My very good Monsieur Baisemeaux, who ever said so? Your independence is well known.' "'Thank heaven! But your goodness of heart is also known.' "'Ah! Don't speak of it.' "'And your obedience to your superiors. Once a soldier, you see, Baisemeaux always a soldier. And I shall directly obey, and to-morrow morning at daybreak the prisoner referred to shall be set free. To-morrow? At dawn. Why not this evening, seeing that the lettre de cachet bears, both on the direction and inside, urgent? Because this evening we are at supper, and our affairs are urgent too. Dear Baisemeaux, booted though I be, I feel myself a priest, and charity has higher claims upon me than hunger and thirst. This unfortunate man has suffered long enough, since you have just told me that he has been your prisoner these ten years. 
Abridge his suffering. His good time has come. Give him the benefit quickly. God will repay you in paradise with years of felicity. You wish it? I entreat you. What, in the very middle of our repast? I implore you, such an action is worth ten benedicites. It shall be as you desire. Only our supper will get cold. Oh, never heed that. Besmo leaned back to ring for Francois, and by a very natural motion turned round towards the door. The order had remained on the table. Aramis seized the opportunity when Besmo was not looking to change the paper for another, folded in the same manner, which he drew swiftly from his pocket. Francois, said the governor, let the major come up here with the turnkeys of the Bretonniere. Francois bowed and quitted the room, leaving the two companions alone. End of chapter.